Lord God, thank you that we can be here in your house worshiping you. Thank you that my younger brother and sister-in-law can be here speaking about their ministries in Uganda. Um, Thank you for our chance to hear them. Thank you that we get to be their partners in all of this good work. And we pray a blessing on them uh, for the week that they are here in town. And then as they continue their travels. And we thank you for them. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. Lee also has more degrees, so he shouldn't. There's, a, there's another thing going for him. Um, so you already heard our introduction. You know who we are. We work for Resonate Global Mission. We're in Uganda, and we work with farmers and pastors. And there's the map again. And I've heard some people have been to Kampala and Gulu to do things with Watoto. That's also on the map. Oh, do I have a laser pointer thing on here? Probably, but I don't know how to use it. Oh, look, there's Kampala, and there's Gulu, and that's where we live. So, in case you're wondering where those places were, now you know. We work with a team of people from Resonate, not all in person together, but Resonate groups the different missionaries by region. So we're in the East and Southern Africa region. So this is the whole team of all the people in East and Southern Africa plus their families. We had a retreat this year, and so that's all of us. And then this one is more specifically the people who are working in Uganda and their families. And some of them are partner missionaries, so they're not officially working for Resonate, but they're partnered with Resonate. And then others are our colleagues in Resonate. So that just gives you an idea. We're not just there by ourselves, but we're working with other people. And you. And not all of the children were in that photo. Um, So we have a lot of national staff who are hired from Uganda or Kenya that work with us. And especially in my work, we're doing a lot of that work together. And they're they're not Christian Reformed, but they're uh, from different denominations. And we value them immensely on our team. So we've already we we've already gone through this again. So or we've already gone through that. So we won't go through that again. We can continue. But now I'll tell you more about helping without hurting in Africa. So this came again from the book When Helping Hurts. And so I worked with Johnny in the photo there on the left and Brian Fickert. And we took a lot of years. I think when I came the other time to Brookfield, I was still writing. And uh, that we're holding the book in that in that photo. And it's contextualized for Africa to help pastors and development workers think about how to care for the poor in wise ways, especially since in Africa there's a lot of dependency that has been built up. Uh, there's a lot of, even right now, aid, aid work and charity work that is causing problems even as they try to help. And... We wrote this as a book, I mean, as a curriculum, even though it's in a book form. So it's really intended not that you sit and read it, but that you go through it with a group of other leaders and you learn a lot from each other in the discussions. And so we published this about two or three years ago, and it's really starting to get attention, and we have many opportunities to teach it more opportunities than we can do. We don't have enough time, and we're trying to encourage more people that you can use this yourself. You don't have to call us as the authors to lead it. You can, you can under, study it, understand it, and lead it yourselves for, for your groups. But we're being invited by different organizations. So in the last year, we did trainings for all the World Renew staff. That World Renew used to be CRWRC. So all the World Renew staff... In, in Uganda and their partners, and then all the World Renew staff in Kenya and their partners, all the World Renew staff in Tanzania and their partners, and other organizations that just find us and contact us and say, hey, we want you to train our staff in this curriculum. So we have a lot of opportunity. It's really exciting. It's also tiring because when I go back in November, I'm going to, I can't even remember my schedule, but In the next six months when we go back, I'll be going to Kenya, I'll be going to Ethiopia, I'll be going to Malawi, I'll be going to Ghana, 
number of trainings in Uganda. So there's just, it's a lot going on, but it's exciting. So my work has been changing more in this direction. Um, I'll share one story with you about that. We trained, we trained a group of leaders from around the continent over Zoom, which was challenging. Um, but one of them named Linda, she works with a development organization in Karamoja, which is in eastern Uganda, and it's a very poor region. When she came to the training, she was going for her own enrichment, but her mindset changed during the training, and she went back testifying, I used to just think that we, to help our people in Karamoja, that we just had to sit and wait for grants and, and donors from the West to do anything. She said, I realize now that we are blessed with abundant resources in this land, and we need to utilize them instead of you know, sitting and waiting for foreign donors to change our situation. And so she was really excited to go back and start working with the people, her own people, and using what they have uh, for their development. And that's what we're, we're trying to see. Not that aid is bad. We still want people to give generously uh, for organizations and, and churches in Africa, but in a way that will build them up so that they're more self-sufficient rather than dependent on us. Um, this is World Renew Kenya and many of their partners. So this is a high-level training. What I mean by that is we are targeting the people in power. We're targeting denominational leaders, we're targeting bishops, we're targeting development workers, business leaders, community leaders for this training. So it's, um, it, it's even being used in some colleges now, in different colleges in Africa. So I'm saying that because you have to understand it's very different from Timothy leadership training, which I'll share more about, which is directed more towards people who are not able to get um, Bible college training. So this one is more for people who are educated, who are in positions of influence. Okay, I told you about how I work with farmers, and we do Bible studies along with the agricultural uh, trainings, and we do inductive Bible studies. So that means we read a Bible passage together, like sit in a circle, and ta people read the passage more than once so that we all hear it and take it in well, and then try to retell it using your own words to show that you actually understood it. And then we talk about what does this teach us about God? What does it teach us about us as people, how we should live our lives, and then how can we apply it to our work? as farmers or any other work that someone might, doing, might be doing. But for the most part, these are farmers. So they're thinking, is being a Christian farmer just praying before I pl plant my seeds, or does it affect the way that I actually live? And I really love that Bible study method because then when we go into the agriculture lesson, people start making connections back to the Bible passage that we read, like, oh, uh, we, we talked about caring for the things that God gave to us, and so now I see that our soil is really important, so we need to take care of the soil. Or we talked about taking care of God's creatures, and we learned that there are billions of organisms in the soil, and they're all created by God, and so we can take care of God's creatures by taking care of the soil. And so this picture here um, is one of the demonstrations that I do to talk to people about how organic matter is important to the soil. And then we talk about ways that we can add organic matter to the soil and take care of our soil without having to spend money. Um, most of these farmers don't have access to agricultural inputs and probably couldn't afford it even if they did. And so we're looking at ways that they can improve their land without spending money. And one of the ladies who was in this particular group said that her, her application was that she started putting grass and leaves and crop residue on her garden instead of clearing it all away. Because traditionally, people look at a farmer and say, if your land is messy, like it's got some leaves on it, like you're not being a good farmer. And so they make very sure at the end of the season to clear everything away. And so it's just bare dirt completely. And when she learned that it's helpful for preventing erosion and keeping the soil cool and helping to add nutrients, she said she started putting things back onto the soil and feeding her soil. And she saw that it helped her garden do better that year. 
And then a lot of the people have said that it, doing the Bible study also impacts them personally in their spiritual life, and then they're able to share it with other people in their churches and communities about how they can look for what God is doing in scripture passages. So it's not just looking at our spiritual life, it's not just looking at our farming, but how all of it goes together. And this, this guy, Deo, he was one of the farmers in another group who offered to grow some cover crops in his garden to multiply the seeds and share with other people. And he's showing off his cover crops to us there and telling us about how his neighbors would start walking by and say, what is that? And he'd tell them about it. And they're all asking him to save some seeds for them also so that they could have some too to plant in their gardens. So what I gather is that you support other missionaries that use Timothy leadership training. Very cool. I've uh, been investing most of my life into TLT for, since 2014. It's only recently that I've moved a little bit away from that for this other curriculum that I told you about. But TLT is very effective at raising up church leaders, uh, to, especially if they've not been to Bible college. How can they be a pastor? They're already functioning as pastors. They're already preaching. But how can we help them in a quick way to learn how to study the Bible, learn how to preach, learn how to do pastoral care, learn how to teach about giving, and have financial accountability in their churches? It's very effective. It's, uh, you sit in a circle, you discuss God's Word together, you share, so it's very inductive. It's not someone lecturing. And then it's very practical. People make an action plan to actually go out and do what God's Word says, which is one of our weaknesses sometimes. We're good at knowing the Bible, but we don't always think about, okay, the Bible's telling me to do this. What can I do this week and actually go and do it? But they do it, <laughs> and so it's really fun to, to train a group of pastors, and then they go out. And this person plants 100 trees. This person goes and reconciles two families that are in dispute. This person goes and talks to alcoholics, and some of them get saved. It's just on and on and on, really great stories of what people do as they go through TLT. So if you go back, those are um, some of the facilitators that we work with on the left, uh, I used to do a lot of the trainings myself, and later I transitioned to coaching other facilitators and training other facilitators who are doing the regular trainings. And now I'm not even doing as much of that anymore. You can go to the next slide because I told you we hired Stephen, who is a wonderful, wonderful Pentecostal pastor who now is leading our TLT programs for Resonate in Uganda. And so I supervise him and work with him very closely. This is in Malawi, this particular one. We are now trying to network TLT facilitators in our region. So in Ethiopia, Zambia, Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, we're trying to link them up together to learn from each other, to work together as we take TLT to, to new countries. When we take TLT to a new country, the idea is that we start one group in that country, it takes two years to finish, and then that group will lead other people in their country. We won't have to keep coming. Um, so it's going very well. There's much fruit. Um, I won't share a lot of stories right now about it. Sarah will share a story about it, but it's, it's something that I'm still very passionate about, even though the time for me, I have less time for it now, but I still highly uh, promote it. Okay, the TLT story actually connects with this. So my favorite thing to teach is the agricultural things, but I get a lot of requests for learning how to bake cakes because cakes are not a traditional Ugandan food and almost no one has an oven. And so I taught some people how to make a cake without an oven because the first year that we were in Uganda, we did not have an oven. Now I have an oven, but before I did not, and I really like baking, and so I had to figure out how can I make the things that I like to eat without an oven. So we, we make cakes. You can do this, you can do this when you're camping, but you use a big pot with some water in it, a smaller pot with your cake in it. You put the pot in so it's floating on the water, cover the big pot, and then boil the water. And as it boils, it cooks the cake, it steams it. And as long as the water doesn't boil off, it won't burn. And if it does boil off, then you end up with charcoal. I know from experience, but it's very easy. And so 
anyone can learn how to do it, and so I get a lot of requests to do that. And the traditional, the more traditional way is to use sand in the bigger pot. So this one, they're using a charcoal stove, and then they're putting sand in the bigger pot and then the cake on top of the sand. But that one's a little more tricky because you have to balance the heat of the sand. And if it gets too hot, it burns the outside of the cake and the inside isn't done. But there are people who are really skilled at that, like some of my friends who make very nice cakes using that method. But for beginners, the steaming is the best method. And I put this other picture because it really cracks me up. That was one of the people that I taught, and so he sent me a picture of a cake he made later, and his name is Tom. So he, <laughs> he, he wrote his own name on his cake. <laughs> but here's how this connects with TLT. So these ladies are in a part of Uganda, the eastern part of Uganda, right where it borders Kenya, and their church had a Timothy leadership training at the church. And they were talking about stewardship and using your money and your resources that God has given you well and carefully. And in the church, most people were not married in the church. Uh, that means that they had gone through the traditional process of marriage where you pay a dowry to the, the family of the woman. And so they had done that, but they had never had a church wedding because a church wedding is really expensive. You can't just invite 10 people. You have to invite the entire church and anyone who wants to come. And so they just felt like it was out of their ability to be able to do a church wedding. But from TLT, they said, okay, what if we do a mass wedding at our church? All of us who want to get married, we all get married on the same day, and we share the cost, and then it's affordable. And so they're like, okay, we'll do that. And then they said, what if, what if we can also make our own cakes instead of buying them for a lot of money? And so the facilitator knew us and said, well, I know someone who could teach you how to make cakes. So I went to the next training and I taught these ladies to make cakes. So that's one of the cakes that they made. And then they made the cakes for the mass wedding. And it was, I think, 57 couples who got married on the same day and they made their own cakes and they all got married in church. And it was a result of TLT that they did that. And you might be a little confused, but the, the church has a view that you have to be married in the church to be really not living in sin. It's like, it's okay if you become a Christian and you haven't been married in church, then you can get married then. But it's not okay if you're already a Christian just to do the traditional marriage and not the church wedding. You have to do the, the both. So anyway, so it's a complicated thing. So the radio ministry said we started it during COVID. We really talked a lot about the false teachings that were going around about COVID and a lot of people saying it's the end times, we're all going to die, or God is going to destroy our country, whatever. So we talked a lot about suffering, God's providence, God's sovereignty. That was really well received. And then we said, why don't we continue doing this? Because everyone is giving us such affirmation that let's, let's not stop. So we continued. We, we do this um, once a week on Saturday evenings. And we have a team. So it's not only me teaching now. We also have Stephen, who works for Resonate, teaching about marriage and family. And then we have some other teachers as well. Stephen, speaking about marriage and family, often gets people calling him and wanting marriage counseling over the phone. And they'll meet for like an hour over the phone or they'll invite him to their homes to have marriage counseling. Um, so we... It becomes an in-person ministry sometimes, even though it starts on the radio. We think, according to the radio station, there's maybe around a million people listening at a time. We don't know exactly how many. It could be an exaggeration, but it's, a, it's, a, it's well known. Because if I go to a church, someone invites me to preach at a church, I can say, you know, how many people maybe have heard me on the radio before? And it's like two-thirds sometimes of the people. So it's, it's well listened to. So we enjoy that uh, ministry. You can continue to, to pray for us on that. Okay, so with the nutrition trainings, the two main plants that I focus on are called chaya and moringa. You might possibly have heard of moringa because it's sold as a superfood powder and you can add it to your smoothies and that kind of thing. But it's a 
tree that grows in Uganda and the leaves are really nutritious. They're high in protein and iron and vitamins and all that kind of good stuff. And you can eat them fresh like a vegetable or you can dry them and grind them and add them to food. And so it's really easy for people to add that to their diet in Uganda because you can just add the powder to rice or to beans or to porridge. That's that's like cornmeal porridge and then it does have a flavor, but it's not so overpowering that it's distasteful. And so it's a good way for people to add some extra nutrition into their diet. And then chaya is a, a plant that grows into a bush. And it comes originally from Central America, but it grows really well in Uganda. It's the perfect climate. And no pests, no diseases. It, dry, it grows in the dry season. You don't need to water it. And so you have this constant source of greens. And in Uganda, people like to eat greens cooked with a peanut sauce. So they use peanut, peanut butter, not like peanut butter here, no sugar or anything added to it, just peanuts. And it's a really tasty sauce. And you can prepare these greens the same way that they prepare other local greens. And it's almost exactly the same taste. So everyone that I've shared this one with is super excited because they can grow it so easily and it tastes just like the other greens that they already like. So those are really fun to share with people because they're, they're so simple to do. And I'm looking forward to the day when I go to someone's home who I've never met and they serve me chaya and are like, have you heard of this vegetable? But it hasn't happened yet. Hopefully someday it will happen in the future. <laughs> But it has spread around a lot already from Sarah. So I told you about this group already in the church. Um, we're reading a book right now by a Zambian pastor, Conrad Mbewe, about the church. And it's been prompting a lot of discussions about, okay, we're realizing we're not doing things the right way in our church as far as baptism or as far as church discipline or membership. And then we have discussions about, okay, how do we bring change <laughs> to the, our, our churches if we are convicted that we need to change some practice. And it gets complicated because we have bishops over us and, you know, we only have so much power to make changes. But uh, it's a really wonderful discussion group. This was at, uh, at a pork joint, a local pork joint, where we ate together just before we um, came to the U.S. We ate pork and chips. <laughs> So they just serve it in a big platter, and then you all reach in and eat it. What's that? What are chips? Chips are French fries. Yeah. And I've told you about the, the roast pig. We've told you about the group. Um, one of the things that's come out of the group is a lot of, um, a lot of our friends have deep marriage problems, and so that has led us at times to do some kind of marriage counseling with some of the couples privately. Um, what else can we say about the small group? Anything? Yeah, we talked about how to, how to do conflict resolution, and that led to us really strongly challenging one another in the group to really talk about the, the people who have hurt us and go and make a, a step. And some good stories have come out of that, like our friend who had a really bad problem with his neighbor, and now they're, they're reconciled. Yeah, and the small group is also good for us because we have a group of friends that are with us and who challenge us and who ask us good questions and help us grow in our faith as well. So I told you about the youth Bible studies and how kids were out of school for two years, and that was really awful, but it was a great opportunity for them to grow in their faith and learn how to lead Bible studies and facilitate them and get some some new skills and understanding of God's word. The Once the groups had grown and multiplied, and I was no longer facilitating but just going, some of the older youth asked if I could teach them some extra things. And so I started meeting with them in the middle of the week. So they'd have their Bible study on Saturday, 
then in the middle of the week we'd talk about the passage they were going to study the next time and then we did little studies on church history and reading um, the Apostles Creed and the Athanasian Creed and learning about the history of the church in Africa and so that was really fun for me because we got to go deeper in some different topics that they're really interested in and some of these kids continue to come and visit me when they're on their school holidays. In Uganda, the majority of kids go to boarding school, and they're in school most of the time. So when they go to school, I don't see them at all until they come back for a one-week vacation. Or over Christmas, it's about a month and a half. And so when they come back on those vacations is when they'll they'll call me or they'll see me at church and say, can we come and visit you? And they'll come over to our house and ask me about my garden or what is life like in America. They wanted to know what is technology like in America now. So that's what I have to report to them when I go back. And, but it's really, it's really nice to have that kind of relationship with them and that they're willing to come with, come with questions and ask for advice. And so I feel like I have all of these kids in Uganda to go back to. The technology has overwhelmed us already. Like our vehicle, you press a button to open it, and then people are speaking to things in the kitchen to turn music on and off. It's really crazy. Um, well, this is another aspect of our work that we didn't mention. We partner with the Pentecostal Assemblies of God Uganda, and they're the ones who also help us get our work permits and everything. Resonate gives them a grant that we helped to design with them for Karamoja, which is a poor region we told you about in eastern Uganda. And there's not any groups there that are fully unreached according to like mission classifications, but there are groups there that are mostly unreached that don't have a lot of churches among them. This is with the Ik people, which are very isolated, and this area of Uganda has a lot of violence and insecurity of different tribes raiding one another's cattle um, or stealing from each other with AK-47s and so forth. It's a lot more peaceful now than it used to be, but it's still insecure. This is Jacob. Um, this, this grant is for church planting among the Ik people. Jacob is the one who's the key person overseeing the church planters in this area. And there's just a couple churches that we're starting um, that are the focus right now. And those churches are doing really well numerically, but it's really hard to keep a, a pastor there and have a pastor who's trained. Um, yeah, and the, Jacob has done TLT with me, and now he's also doing TLT with the people of those churches to try to strengthen them. This is us and one of the bishops on the right praying for one of the church planting couples. Um, Jacob himself almost died a couple of years ago when he was driving his motorcycle down the road and was ambushed by some of the raiders. And for whatever reason, they decided not to kill him, but they robbed him. Um, but he was very grateful for prayers for these guys as they work in, in difficult places. So now we're just going to show you a few pictures about life in Uganda, then we'll have some time for questions. We drive on the left side of the road, and it's chaotic. This is Soroti. This is a small town, so this is not chaotic. This is easy. But what I like about this picture is the guy in the bicycle, and I'm wondering what he's thinking. <laughs> because he's going right in front of all these motorcycles coming really fast. So... <laughs> and, our, and our car. So um, this is a little bit of Soroti. You can go to the next one. Yeah, we'll just go through these real quick just to give you a taste of our life. This is a view over part of Soroti. Soroti is super flat, but there's one landmark of that hill. And they call it Soroti Rock. And then these are some shops underneath the rock. Then this is the church that we attend. It's a Pentecostal church in Soroti. And on Sundays, we were a little disappointed that your offering didn't include auctioning off live animals, but 
that is actually a really cool thing that people can give an offering of something that they have. If they don't have money, they can bring something from their garden, and then the church will auction it off during the service, and someone in the church will buy it with money, and then the money goes to the church, and so they can use it for their church things. Uh, then we always have car problems, which is super annoying in a place where there are not many options for car repair. And so we we have this guy that we really like who's a mechanic, but he works at a garage where they also train people to be mechanics. And so Anthony was there one time where the mechanic was working on the car and there are like 40 guys watching to learn how to do it. So here he is taking apart the door on our car to try to figure out the locking mechanism. And it took like months before that got fixed because getting the parts and then they got the wrong parts and then they had to get new parts and that was fun. And then also there's a rat that got into another vehicle and Anthony killed it with a stick. Yeah. In this, so that's also fun. Uh, then we have power outages all the time and we still do our work in the darkness, but we can get avocados as big as our head. So for less than a dollar. And this is a possible Ugandan breakfast. It's a chapati, which is a fried bread and milk tea. And then here is a possible Ugandan lunch. If you are a visitor and a guest, they'll serve you meat and all kinds of different choices. Um, we are not very good hosts because we would serve people like one dish and maybe a side dish. When you go to someone's house in Uganda, they've got like five different starches and then all of these different sauces to put on it and we just can't do it. But there's, um, this one has chicken and smoked meat and then these are greens cooked with peanut sauce and rice and then this is the traditional bread in the region where we live which they make out of cassava flour and tapioca is made out of cassava so if you know that texture that sticky texture of tapioca it's sticky and so it's cassava and millet or sorghum and so you break off a piece of that sticky bread and use it to scoop up your food then this is the market in Soroti they built a new structure just a few years ago so it's very fancy but you can see there are lots of vendors selling all their vegetables and then upstairs there's a level of um tailors sewing things and then here's all the flour and beans and then underneath there there's people selling live chickens and butchers and fish and all kinds of stuff so that's where we go to do our shopping yeah this is really nice it has a roof and the the old one people just kind of put their own tarps over their their stand and one time I fell in the mud when it was slippery and that was really embarrassing. <laughs> okay, so we shared this before, the things that you can do. Thank you for your support. You can also support the East Africa Leadership Training Fund that that helps to pay for pay people like Stephen who are doing Timothy leadership training and then you can get our email updates if you sign up on that sheet out there. You can get our prayer cards you can um, learn more about those things from our table. So I didn't mention this in the, the sanctuary, but we're doing translation for Helping Without Hurting in Africa. There's a big request for it already in many different languages, but we want to start with French because much of Africa is French-speaking, especially West Africa, and then Kiswahili. So I was hoping by the time we were here to give you more information about that, but it's still in, in process. But I may be asking our supporting churches for help with the translation work sometime in the future. So I'm just letting you know about that. We're excited to try to get it into the hands of more different people. And Sarah says, if you write a letter, a handwritten letter, she will write you back. She, she doesn't like technology that much. She likes old-fashioned letters. So I mentioned this podcast. That's Stephen uh, that we work with. But I interview different African pastors, and I try to get a variety. Some of them are a, a village pastor who doesn't speak English very well, or maybe some of them not at all. And we get a translator. 
And then some of the people I interview are very well educated uh, with a lot to say. And then sometimes I just interview them about their ministry, and other times we focus on a specific topic. Like one topic was about how, how to give wisely to support different African churches and projects. Uh, another one was about preaching. So you can go to Google, look it up, feel free to listen. And then we have prayer requests. Um, we also have, I think these are the same ones that are on the prayer card that you can get, but pray for the farmers and pastors that we teach that they would put into practice what they learn and God would use them to transform their communities. Pray for safety for us from sickness and road accidents. The biggest danger for us is traveling on the road. It's very chaotic. We always see accidents. Um, we don't get sick that often. We're grateful for that. Um, but there are sicknesses we can get. Um, pray for discernment and a heart of generosity. I mentioned this in, in the sermon, but it is very tiring for us, and it's good that we're here for some months just to have a break, some distance, because a lot of people will focus in on us because we're foreigners, and, and when they see us, they see money, and so they will ask for help. And some of the needs are genuine and some are not, and it's just really takes a lot of time to discern together who to help and how to help wisely. So pray for us that we would not become callous, that we would remain people who are loving and generous, and we would not uh, you know, get bitter with people who are asking. And then we need wisdom and guidance to plan our schedules. That's actually the thing that's stressing me out the most right now while we're here. I almost have all of 2024 planned already because all these training invites that come, it doesn't work unless we plan far in advance. So I'm juggling lots of schedules um, for that. But Sarah, too, Sarah gets requests from all these different churches for doing the farmer groups and other trainings, and we can't do it all. So we have to have discernment to know when to say no. Now we want to give you some time for questions, and preemptively I'll say, I don't know why the goat is on the truck. Someone asked me that at another church, and they're like, we thought you were wanting us to ask about why the goat is on the truck, but I don't know. Maybe someone, this person was transporting stuff, and they're like, oh, a goat, let me buy it, and then they threw it up there, but I don't know the story. <laughs> All right, so are there any questions that anyone would like to ask? Yes. Well, that's a really good question. It's been a long time since the first time we went there, so thinking, trying to think back. Do you have something that you think of off the top of your head? One, one thing that is clear to me, that I grew up kind of loving Africa from watching movies and so forth, but it's very different than what we tend to see on movies. Most Africans live in cities with tall buildings and a lot of development, right? So... Um, that just the idea we have, we might think everyone's living in a mud hut in poverty. That's not the case. There's, you know, huge cities. Um, so that was one thing that was really new to me. And we we're also surprised about how much development there can be even in the village area. So we always laughed when we would stay at a pastor's home and he's staying in a mud hut. And then you'll see him come out of the hut in a perfectly ironed, suit that's just immaculate and I've never dressed that well talking on a cell phone and, you know so your perceptions can be can be different and also we learned that don't associate people living differently than you with poverty so just because they're living differently doesn't mean that they're miserable or that they're in great poverty now there is a lot of poverty in Uganda but living in a grass thatch hut is not necessarily poverty. They're actually really nice. And the floors are smeared with cow dung, which becomes hard like cement. So it's not like you're walking on dirt and getting everything dirty. It's like immaculately clean inside and really beautiful. So a lot of those perceptions can be challenged. Other questions? 
the, the question about syncretism, um, it's not necessarily tribal religion that gets mixed with Christianity, but just kind of an overarching what, what is called African traditional religion. It's not necessarily unique to someone's tribe, but just kind of a worldview and way of thinking that gets mixed into Christianity. And the place you see it the most is with the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel largely is coming from the U.S. to Africa, but it also connects really well to African traditional religion where you bribe the deities and spirits to do what you want them to do. And it's the same thing with God. If you give this, he has to give you this. So the prosperity gospel is really attractive naturally to to people there. And so that's maybe the biggest issue that we fight against in, in teaching. What is the true gospel? What is the nature of suffering? How does God answer prayer? All of that. Surprisingly smooth because on the ground, those different denominations don't <laughs> relate well to each other. When it comes to resonate, it seems like there's... There aren't those issues. But most of the time in our trainings, we try to make it ecumenical. And that's really healthy. Because we can be proud of our, our individual beliefs. That's, we're not trying to muddy things down, water them down. But like we had TLTs where people come together. For example, a bunch of Anglican pastors coming for the training and the facilitators being Pentecostal pastors. And at the end of that, Pentecostal pastors saying, we didn't think that these people were born again, but now we know actually they are. (laughs) And they would go home and tell their people, you know, we shouldn't be so judgmental on the Anglican church. There are real saved people in that church too. So we're trying to bring people together. Again, not to say that we don't have differences. We do. We don't have to pretend that, but we can still do some of these trainings together. There's some things that we can do together. Yeah, good question. In Uganda, English is the official language, so it's pretty easy to get get around with just English because almost everywhere you go, at least someone speaks English. And even uh, when I have a group of not very well-educated women and they say, we need a translator because we don't speak English, if I tell a joke, usually people laugh before it's translated. And so I know that they speak, they understand, they're just a little shy. But we do have to have translation sometimes because maybe, maybe people are shy, like they don't feel comfortable speaking in English, which if any of you know a second language, speaking in that language is way harder than listening and understanding. And so you might feel like, I can't, I can't speak it. But actually, you could have a conversation if you wanted to. So in Uganda, there are over 40 languages spoken besides English, which makes a big challenge for us to learn another language because you go from one town to the next town and they're speaking another language, and especially with all the traveling that Anthony's doing, if we focus on learning this one language and then we go to the next town, suddenly it's useless and we need a translator. And we actually, when we moved to our house that we built, we moved five miles within Soroti, the same town. And the language that people are speaking in the area around us is different from the one where they were speaking on the other side of town. And so that just makes us feel discouraged because we're like, oh, we're not smart enough to learn all of these languages at once. At least we can greet people and we know a few words, but uh, for the most part, we're just using English and then translators. All right, how hot is it? So where we live, it gets pretty hot. There is no winter, there's rainy season and dry season. And during the rainy season, it's in the 80s. During the dry season, it's in the hundreds and uh, very dry. So from the middle of December until the beginning of April, pretty much there's no rain at all. It's completely dry and it's super hot. So it's really weird at Christmas because it's very hot and we have to close our windows at night and curtains and turn on the Christmas lights and then we sort of feel like our bodies feel like it's it's Christmas but we're still wearing shorts and t-shirts but then during the rainy season it's a little bit cooler but not a lot but then there are parts of Uganda that are cooler because they're higher elevation more mountainous Um, there's a place where it probably gets down to 65 during the day, I don't, something like that. 
and it feels really cold to us and other people going there from Soroti. I went somewhere with some Ugandans and it was probably in the 60s and they were telling me that they were afraid to shower because it was so cold. <laughs> that they might die. Um, I think Evie also asked us if we have AC. We don't have AC, but we have fans. And those work really well when the power is on. When the power is off, which is almost every day, for a couple hours, then the fans don't work. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the questions. Feel free to stay after and talk to us more. We won't go away until you're done talking to us. So.